This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers. In today's postmodern world, liberty has a variety of meanings. There are actually ideologies that think control is the answer to real and true liberty. In the realm of the Christian religion, many denominations have concluded that true liberty comes only through faith in Jesus Christ, which happens to be true, but the notion that's portrayed is it means we are free from the law that somehow the tenets of law inhibit real liberty and the only way to experience true liberty is to recognize the law was replaced by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Can this be true? Or instead, are we to understand true liberty is obtained by the rule of law in combination with the faith we have in Christ? Is there a harmony associated with these two segments that many Christians are missing today? Well, stay with us as we explore these questions on today's program. In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now your host, Tony Bukert. Well, hello there, friends, and welcome to another international telecast of the Armor of God. And I want to bring your attention to a specific book in the Bible that's going to serve as our platform for today's topic. And in specific, I want to talk about the book of Galatians. Now, certainly, if you are familiar as a Christian or you study the Bible, you'll be aware of the fact that certainly the book of Galatians is a very interesting book indeed. Some of the things that the Apostle Paul was dealing with in the church of Galatia certainly did cause him at sometimes a, a lot of stresses due to the doctrines that were going around and causing, well, newly converted people to really question how salvation comes to us and really goes a long way to tell us about our Christian liberties. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul was dealing with a lot of subversive attitudes. When the Apostle Paul was out of town, he was away at another church. Certain people would creep in and tell people the Apostle Paul wasn't right, that salvation wasn't through grace, but salvation was via circumcision and the strictest to the letter observance of the law and it forces Paul's hand to start the topic and discussion to correct the theology that was going around in the Galatian church on exactly how salvation is achieved and the mode by which liberties are secured, not only in the world of course, because liberties in the world are secured through what? Sacrifice and through law and Christianity is a, a lot similar in that regard the fact that our salvation and our liberties only come through blood sacrifice and the adherence to morality and or law. So here we come to the book of Galatians and the Apostle Paul is forced to deal with the issue and to correct the, the perception that was going around that you had to be circumcised and or have the strictest observance of the law in order to be saved. And it's unfortunate that in today's world of theology that the Apostle Paul, you know, his oftentimes we've said on here before, and I'm sure you've read it back there in the book of Hebrews, that the Apostle Paul, his words are sometimes hard to understand because people approach the scriptures from a biased perspective. And I'm sure you've heard this before, that we are no longer obligated to observe God's Ten Commandments, and furthermore, some will tell you that the law has actually been abolished, and it's a shame that this book that we're talking about today, the book of Galatians, is so wrongfully used to show us or to attempt to prove to us that we now live in a di different dispensation of time. In the Old Testament, we had to keep the law, but in the New Testament, we're no longer obligated to keep the law. And the Apostle Paul breaking in to all that background I just gave you in Galatians chapter 5 
in verse 1 makes a very unique statement about our liberty. And I just want to read that to you. He says in Galatians 5 and verse 1, uh, let me get over there. He says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. And that second part of the statement the Apostle Paul makes is very key and vital to our understanding and the establishment of expectations that God has for us and also helping us to remember, well, what the achievement was that grants us liberty and freedom and whether or not there are any more expectations. And it's a shame that in the Galatian church they were forgetting that they had to rely on Jesus Christ for salvation, you know, His blood sacrifice. But yet at the same time, if you're going to say the law has been done away with, are we saying that there's no morality expected from us? Well, as we go down through the scriptures today, you'll see that in fact that sacrifice and morality are the, are the means by which we do secure salvation and liberty. So I'm going to use our, our national circumstances here or our origins to illustrate that principle. But before I do that, let me just break into our offering today and make some things available to you and bring your attention to a booklet that we have for you. And the booklet is entitled, The Book of Galatians. A commentary. It's a very, very good read. It's a very studious read and has a lot of details and, uh, about Galatian church and what was going on. And it's going to help you to understand the real issues of the Galatian church. And the, the, the book of Galatians is known as the, the Declaration of Indep Independence for Christians because it says we're freed from the law. But is that really what the book of Galatians is talking about? Again, Going back to the literature offer, we also have a CD that is entitled Rely on Christ because there is no other way or any other name or any other mode by which we are saved other than the blood sacrifice and the consequent acceptance of Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior as a means and a mode to our salvation and the security of our liberties that Christ has given us. But that doesn't mean it's a free-for-all. We can do anything that we want. So reach out to us if you would, please. Just pick up the phone and dial 888-578-8791. Again, that's 888-578-8791. And uh, order those, those, uh, those items we have made available to you today. And also, if you'd like to hit us up for any questions you might have, just simply hit, it, type into your browser there, info at cgi.org or in your email, and ask any question you like that you might have as a result of today's program. And also visit us at www.cgi.org and uh, just view some of the things we have available for you on there. And while you're there, you'll notice that we also have a webcast every Saturday. Times will be determined uh, on the internet, so you want to double check those times, but we want you to reach out to us and let us help you in your walk with Jesus Christ, and specifically in the understanding of some of the sayings that are written in the scriptures, so we can fully understand the mode of salvation and the way by which our liberties are secured because there are expectations of morality that God has for us. Now, before I went into the literature offerings, I was talking about some of the details that were going on in the troubles and some of the challenges Paul he was faced with in the church of Galatia. And certainly he did have a rough time there uh, in, in trying to kind of stamp out some of these little fires that, that were going on. And oftentimes when people turn to the book of Galatians, you know they will actually look at this, this book and say, this is the book that they'll either call the Declaration of Independence for Christians, or they will actually call it the Emancipation Proclamation because it releases us from the slavery that we found ourselves in under the law. But there are some things that we have to understand and that we have to review to really get a grasp, a, a full grasp of what was going on in the Corinthian, in the Galatian church rather, to really get our focus set right on what the book of Galatians is really addressing and are there expectations for us. And when you look at the, the country that that we are, we are in, or some of us are in here in the United States of America, or those who might be in a, in a Western culture, you know, we have a very, very unique perspective on this thing called liberty, because our country was founded on the premise of liberties and freedom. You know, you, you, you look at some of the, the national icons that, that we have, and you, one of the, the major ones that stand out in my mind when you talk about freedom from tyranny, from oppression, 
you know, from poverty. What is one of the, the, the iconic the iconic things that come to your mind that, that people look to as the symbol of our freedoms in this country? Well, I don't know about you, but naturally in my mind, what I'm thinking about is I'm thinking about all those millions upon millions of immigrants coming into Ellis Island, and we had a gift given to us by France. And you know I'm talking about the Statue of Liberty, how she stands there with her torch as a beacon in the night that's, that says that this is the place to come for opportunity and liberty. You know, we fought a couple wars on this soil to secure our freedoms from tyranny, from oppression, from, from tyrants, you see. And that's the important thing about law. When you have lawless men running around, invoking their will with impunity on humanity, that's when everybody's liberties, well, they, they, they tend to go by the wayside. So you understand that law serves a very purpose in kind of keeping certain people at bay, you know, so they can't just have free will to do what they want, thereby enslaving people and oppressing people. And, you know, we see that all over the world, don't we? You know, when I think about the word liberty or the concept of liberty, I can't help but assign that concept to the one who actually created, who's responsible for it. You know, God is the author of the idea of liberty and freedoms. Because when you take a look at man and what they have done in the world, you know, almost every single time when you view through the, through the pages of history what mankind has done to each other, mankind, when left to their own vices, will always choose slavery and oppression and violence. As a matter of fact, to further my point, you know, in our country, we have a, well, we have a blemish, we have a tarnish on our record. You know, we have this thing called slavery that we dealt with. We even fought the Civil War over slavery to abolish that and to secure liberties for a segment of people that were really under, under oppression. I mean, we have a very, very unique perspective. It's ironic, however, that when you take a look at how wars were fought and how securities were, you know, how they were given through, through blood and sacrifice and then laws were established to secure, to secure those freedoms, you might be surprised to hear, maybe you've heard this before, maybe this might be the first time you're, you're hearing this, but do you realize that the biggest illegal industry in the world today, you know, it's, it's not marijuana, uh, it's not drugs, it's not, it's not that culture, the biggest illegal industry industry in the world today is slavery and that might be hard to understand and that might be hard to realize given the modern era that we're in but roughly speaking roughly speaking because you can get statistics from different locations on the internet and they do vary a little bit but roughly 60 million people are in slavery today not by any any choice of their will some some 10,000 in the, the sex slave industry some other 15,000 they're they're sent off they're taken captive and they're in, in the first forced workforce so when you look at the record friends when you take a look at really where this term I, uh, liberty comes from it has to come from god because mankind has never chosen that they've always chosen to oppress and to enslave and to be tyrants that that's that's been our record and that's the tarnish that we have on our country, and we have to recognize that. However, with that being said, you realize there is nobody, no culture, no skin tone in the world that doesn't have their hands defiled with this thing called slavery because every nation at one time or another has been involved in this thing called slavery. But see, God doesn't want us to be enslaved. God wants us to be free. And in our country, our founding fathers knew that with the the offering of liberties and freedoms, that we would have to maintain a certain moral code and we'd have to respect the blood sacrifice of those who secured our liberties for us, otherwise we would lose them. I got a couple quotes for you here. Let's look at what Thomas Jefferson said, and for the sake of being accurate, I have them in my notes. But Thomas Jefferson said this, and can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed the only firm basis a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they are not to be violated, but with his wrath. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep 
forever. Furthermore, John Adams, in giving a speech to the military in uh, 1778, said this, We have a government armed with power capable of contending with, uh, we have, well, let me reverse that, we have no government, rather, armed with proper capable uh, of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. Our constitution was made for a moral people, a righteous people. It is wholly inadequate to govern any other. It's amazing that when you look at the, the founding fathers, do you know where they came up with the idea for our justice systems, for our legal systems? Regardless of how imperfect they may be, I would rather be here than anywhere else going, going in any kind of a trial. But you know what they turn to, believe it or not? The book of Genesis, the book of Leviticus, the book of Deuteronomy, because they knew that God the Father, as imperfect as their concept was of, of what God is and who He is and what He's doing, they had this part right, that liberty is a concept created by God. It has to be cherished and respected. But with all that being said, friends, what about Christianity? How are our liberties secured? How are our freedoms realized? What about our salvation? Is it a responsibility on our part? Or is it like people say about the book of Galatians? It, the law is done away with. There really is no moral code as far as defined by a codified Ten Commandments. It's really just kind of a moralistic feeling that you can kind of go with. Or... We can allow God to define that for us, and, and that's key, and that's, that's vital. So nationally, we can look at that, but some of these preachers out there today are preaching a doctrine based on a liberation theology that will teach you that we are free from any obligation of observing God's laws, and really, it's just a matter of belief today. All you have to do is believe to be saved. But is that really what's being said? Let's go over to the book of Peter, actually. Um, let's go to um, 2 Peter to illustrate a point. The book of 2 Peter. And there's a couple verses I want to get at. I just want to read verse 1 and then I want to skip over to, to a couple other ones. I just wanted to set the context in verse 1. But there are also false prophets among the people. Even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And that's pretty much what was going on in the church of Galatia as people were setting aside the grace that was afforded to them by the sacrifice of Christ and saying, oh, no, 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 it's the law that saves you. You have to observe the law to be saved. But really, the law never had a mode of salvation to it. It's a moral code that we follow and it teaches us right from wrong. So we're not really free from that. But furthermore, as we read down through the book of 2 Peter in seven, verse 17 through 22, let's just read this. And then he's going to refer back to the context in his opening statement, verse 1. And he's going to bring it right back to who he's talking about and what he's talking about. These, these false prophets, are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they themselves, excuse me, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption, for by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped, the, now, now notice, what, notice what he does here. Notice how he brings it back right to our responsibilities, okay? He says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and as we've already said here in a little bit of the opening remarks, you know, we do need to acknowledge something. We need to acknowledge that salvation only comes through one name. It only comes through one mode. It comes through the name of Jesus, the Messiah, the one who's revealed in the New Testament, the author of Christianity, so to speak. And it also comes through a moral code. You know, you can't just accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior and then just conduct ourselves in any which way that we want to because, quite frankly, you have the God of everything who, who sets the standards and it sets you know, the expectation. So really, when you look at the Bible, you know what I really consider the Bible? What we really con should consider it? 
How about our Constitution? This is the Christian Constitution. It does, in fact, grant us liberty, but not liberty from observance of the law or morality. It grants us liberty from the penalties of the law, the death penalty, namely, if we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, and we do our best to aim for the mark and, and not to sin. So there is a reward that comes with conducting ourselves properly, but let's not confuse the issue. Salvation is a gift. It is gifted to us. But can we lose it? Absolutely. We can just turn it back in and say we don't want to be a part of it. And we can illustrate that through our conduct. It's our choice, basically. So we continue in verse 21. And the, the Apostle Paul here, uh, or rather here in, in the book of Peter, it says, For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteous, righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Now, here, wait a minute. He's talking about the holy commandments? What commandments is he talking about? Well, some people will say that Jesus Christ gave some new commandments and that we're only obliga obligated to keep a couple of them. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about the Decalogue. He's talking about, you know, the first four that cover idolatry and the sec last six that cover covetousness. He's talking about the law, about our responsibility in regards to the law. And he continues, But it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. So what is he saying here? He's saying, look, you've accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and His sacrifice for salvation, and you want His liberties, and you want to be secure in those liberties, but just remember this, that the, the mode of salvation does come through Him, but He has expectations for us, and He likens it unto a dog in the most disgusting act that you've ever seen, probably if you've owned a dog, when a dog re regurgitates, He returns to it and He consumes it. And it's by, he's basically saying this is an example of a, a vile behavior to be enlightened by Jesus Christ, to understand his holy expectations, as imperfect as we are, we still have to try. He likens it unto a dog returning to consume what it just regurgitated, and thereby God is disgusted by immorality. So already we can see that, that God does have some expectations due to the analogies that he's using here. And He's really setting the record straight on this relationship between law and grace and law and sin, how it all fits together and how it works. And there's a lot of misconceptions, a lot of bad theologies out there, friends, that will tell you that once you're, you reside in Jesus Christ, all you have to do is believe. But a lot of people will stop there at the word believe, you know, but they won't actually dig into the word believe and see what it means. You know, believe is an action word. Believe is something that you don't only just acknowledge, but belief leads you to action. And if you believe something or somebody, our natural proclivities are to either emulate, to follow, or to get in line with what they say that we should be doing. So there are some things that are said about the law that I think that we, we should go over. And as a matter of fact, over here in Romans chapter 7, if I could turn to that quickly. Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul makes a statement that really is an eye-opener regarding his perspective on the law and the purpose of it. You see, because that's really where people get confused. See, there is a legitimate use of the law and there is an illegitimate use of the law as you know, we find in the first book of Timothy, the first chapter there, as it's outlined, the purpose of the law, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart. So we, we know all those, those scriptures and if you haven't had time to, to review that, Please do, but the Apostle Paul makes a very poignant statement regarding the law because people actually think that the law is against faith. It contradicts faith, that it's something that we should avoid because it was a mean, old, nasty set of regulations that really only served the purpose to condemn. And, and that certainly, it did have that aspect to it, but really what it does is it, it also teaches us morality. And the Apostle Paul says here in uh, chapter 7, verses 12 through 14, let me just get over there real quick. He says, in regarding the law, he says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Very good question. It's a very interesting perspective to consider when you talk about this thing called liberty and grace and how the law is associated, related to all these, these different things. What is law? 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. 
uh, sin is transgression of God's law. So let's continue. Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, but I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin taking opportunity by the commandment, see, Paul thought his righteousness came from there early on, and he found out that the law really wasn't for that purpose. He said, but sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me by it and killed me. Boy, what a, what a poignant, powerful statement the Apostle Paul made when he, when he made this statement here because his perspective before his walk with Christ began was really askew, it was off. He looked to the law and his ability to keep the law as a crown of righteousness for him. And then he said, wait a minute, sin taking opportunity by the commandment that I thought was to bring life actually brought me death because I was without Christ. So we had to put Christ back into the picture in order to get the full panoramic view of this thing called salvation and liberty. And he continues, Therefore, the law is holy, the commandment holy, and just, and good. Has what is uh, good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good, that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Wow, certainly you know, the Apostle Paul, he really did say a lot of things that are hard to understand. And it really is a shame that people take out of context the things that are being addressed in the book of Galatians. It's, it's sad that we, we refer to it or it has been referred to as the Emancipation Proclamation uh, for Christians that we are freed from this burden of keeping the law. I mean, is the law burdensome? Ah, is it a burden not to steal? A burden not to murder? You know, really what the law does is it sets boundaries. We look at it as in, in the sense that thou shalt not, but really what it is, it's you shall do, but do it in the framework that I give you, because what, what God is doing is saying you shall not, but guess what? The things that you don't want done you, the other person can't do either. So therefore we are set at liberty, as James said. Perfect law of liberty. So let's get into our, our closing statement here at the literature, and let me once again point your attention to what we want to make available to you today, get the booklet, the book of Galatians, a commentary, and reach out to us, friends, and get the CD, Rely on Christ. Remember the number, 888-578-8791. Again, 888-578-8791. Hit us up on the web at www.cgi.org. Any questions you might have, see us at, and hit us up at uh, info at cgi.org. And don't forget that webcast. Well, friends, we're out of time for today. But you keep on your armor, and we'll see you next time right here on the Armor of God. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by the Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at 3900 Thames Street, Tyler, Texas, 75701, or call toll-free at 1-888-578-8791, or call one 939 2929 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at www.cgi.org or email us at armorofgodcgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support. This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers.